<laughs> Welcome back to the bluegrass on this beautiful February afternoon. These pups are seven weeks and four days today. Okay, and this is where we're at. This puppy weighs 15 pounds, and uh, this is what we see what's known as the secondary socialization period. This is when the dog that you bought becomes the dog that you bought, okay? When you go back and you watch the videos, little puppies, they all look the same, but as they start to mature, their type emerges, okay? And what I mean by that is the type of dog they're going to be as they get older, right? And so you can start to tell when you look at this guy, uh, he looks like a serious character, doesn't he? <laughs> He's going to be a serious character as he gets older. You know, and I'm going to put up some uh, pictures in the corner to show you what I mean about type. Back in the day, guys, German Shepherds, Belgian Shepherds, Dutch Shepherds, they were just a general farm dog that you found kind of in Central Europe. And then they established some breed registries and they closed those registries. And so then kind of what happened is uh, each breed became like uh, more concentrated in its genetics. And so you got very specific behavioral tendencies, very specific physical traits. But, you know, if you just go back before those uh, breed standards were established, uh, you had a lot of dogs running around Europe that looked kind of like this. And what I like about this is this nice square build. Okay, you notice that it's not over angulated in the back end. It's got good bone, but it's also got good balance. It's a brave dog, doesn't squirm and whine and carry on so much, not afraid of being up off the ground. You know, I just, I like this type of dog. It's just a great family guard dog, family adventure dog, okay? Now, what are we seeing during this stage, okay? Guys, this stage is just, I mean, it's just chalked full of rapid growth, okay? And what all's growing? The bone is growing, okay? If you can see, like his dog's shoulders, his uh, hindquarters here, where I'm putting, there's a lot of muscle, okay? But we need the bone growth and we need the musculature to develop, but we also need to make sure that we put the dog in physically demanding situations so that the connective tissue grows, okay? And a lot of people try to tell you with these puppies not to exercise them. Guys, listen, exercise reveals problems. It doesn't cause problems. So when I have a dog like this, Okay. I need to like be fooling with him all the time. Make sure that he enjoys full range of motion in his joints and make sure that he learns to climb and pull himself up and develop uh, good balance patterns. Okay. Now look at his ears. Let's see if I can see. You see how one of his ears is kind of starting to stand up? Now the bigger the dogs of this type in a litter, generally the longer it takes for their ears to stand up. So I've got this guy who's one ear's up, one ear's down. I've got a little girl who's only about 12 pounds, both ears are up. And then I've got a big bruiser uh, brindle dog and his ears are flopping because he's going to be bigger than Trump, I think. All right, now what else do we get here? This is something I really want to like pay attention to because at this time of the year it's super important because everybody's worried about can they take their dog outside in the winter, can they take their puppy outside in the winter. Guys, we can't hardly keep these puppies out uh, of the snow and ice and water. All right, now what you see at this stage, let me pull this hair back a little bit. Can you see that cameraman? All right, watch when I pull this hair back. You see that light colored hair, guys? That's what's called an undercoat. And then if I slick it down this way, you have longer hairs, and that's what's called the guard coat. And uh, so basically, if you think in terms of layers, you know how you like have a jacket, you got the goose down jacket, then you have like a Gore-Tex outer shell. This is very similar, right? So you have the insulative layer, then you have the protective layer. But what makes them kind of semi-waterproof and mudproof is the fact that they have oil production on their skin and that oil migrates to the guard hairs. Right. Okay. And so even these puppies at this age, which they've been out a whole lot, your puppy might not come with this much uh, like coat or this much oil on its coat. But these dogs here can be out and it can be sleeting or raining or whatever. And the water just kind of ro you know, rolls right off of them. Okay. You've heard that expression, you know, water off a duck's back. That's because ducks are oily. Okay. So that's, uh, that's where we're at. Okay. <sighs> at seven weeks, what do we have? We've got the emergence of type. We've got good bone development, we've got good musculature development, and we've got good connective tissue development, and the coat has come in and oiled over, and the ears are starting to stand up on this guy. All right, so we'll get another puppy, and we'll talk about some more stuff. Very nice puppy. All right, so I went outside and I got the roller derby queen out of the straw. She was asleep, so she's a little aggravated with me. She growled at me when I picked her up. But you might say, well, Stoney, why do you call this one the roller derby queen? Uh, because she is a big, aggressive female. You know, she weighs more than the male I had earlier, right? She weighs 16 pounds. And uh, so look here, you remember I was telling you about the ears? Remember how the male I had a minute ago, one ear was up and one ear was down? Make a noise, cameraman. 
Look at this dog. Even with the noise, her ears ain't coming up at all. She's going to be big, you know. And then I've got a brindle male, and he's going to be real big too. All right, but so we talked about the, you know, the physical development at, uh, at this stage, okay. And this is kind of what you get. Look at this. See, general type dog, okay. Good, nice square build, a lot of muscle. Uh, connective tissue strong. Look how I can pick her up. She's strong like that. Uh, the coats come in. It's oiled over. I'm hoping that the coat looks real shiny there on the on the screen, so you can see how shiny it really is. Uh, got a nice. Uh, you got a nice clean bite. Okay, you got a lot of you got a lot of bone. You know, some of these dogs nowadays, they got a lot of drive, but they don't have a lot of bone. You know, and so kind of look like darts to me. Like you could throw them and stick them in a dartboard. <laughs> I like these dogs a little bit broader through the muscle, a little bit broader in the head. So that's the physical type that I'm looking at, and I like to really exercise them when they're young because, of course, that makes them seem a little bit more buff. But let's talk about cognitive developments because you know it's flip sides of a coin right you have you have you have uh, physical development and you have cognitive development in other words it's mind so as a breeder not that I'm really a breeder but I play one on YouTube uh, as a breeder my job is to send these puppies to their new homes uh, in as good a shape as I can so I need them to be in good shape physically and I need to have helped them, uh, you know, learn to perceive, to think, to understand, to make decisions, uh, and to have a certain amount of situational awareness as it relates to the environment. And what I mean by that, remember when I first used to put these dogs on the table and they would just take headers, they would just go right off of the table? Well, now, like, uh, they're smart enough not to jump off the table. <laughs> you know, that gets pretty funny. Even if I pull out a toy, and I start playing, like the dogs have enough body awareness, Oh, that they're not going to get themselves in too much trouble. Look at this. Good, very good dog. Here's a strong dog. Very strong dog. Very nice. Oh, you a good dog. Okay, so I'm helping them learn to make decisions, right? And that information is not about me with a clicker. It's not about me telling them sit or down or stand. It's about me putting them into physically and mentally demanding situations and letting life teach them. Okay. Experience is the best teacher, guys. It always has been and always will be. All right, so when I'm fooling with these puppies, every day we try to help them build some basic skills, okay? And what I mean by that is I put them in positions where we can do some problem solving, some pattern cognizance, and we can work on developing proper communication tools. Most all of your dog training communication really boils down to just understanding how to, uh, you know, use proper vocalization and posture, okay? Like I've made videos in the past where people would tell me, you know, Stoney, you got to use this command or you have to use these types of words or whatever. But the reality is, it's like your mom tells you when you're a little kid. It's not so much what you say as it's, uh, you know, how you say it, okay? So I take these puppies out and introduce them to lots of sights and sounds and experiences and environmental conditions. And then I practice calling them using the appropriate uh, vocalization patterns and posture. And I practice using the proper vocalization patterns and posture to stop them from doing things that are dangerous, destructive, or rude. All right, so... If your breeder hasn't done all that work when you get the puppy, right? This puppy's seven and a half weeks old. You can kind of see where it's at. If the breeder had, then get to work and fix that, guys, because you know you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. If you want to get the most out of your dog, which is what we're going to talk about next, then you start the day you get it. You know, right? Oh, it's a good dog. <laughs> okay, so we took a look at the Roller Derby Queen, and now we're going to take a look at Black Sister. <laughs> if you're wondering how this dog got named Black Sister, look, guys, I'm not uh, very good at naming dogs anymore. I'm out of dog names, right? So my little girl named this dog after some, like, anime character or something, I don't know, on Avatar, something like that. All right, but this is the smallest little girl in the litter. And uh, here, cameraman, like, uh, make a little kissy noise at that dog. See if her ears, see, guys, how her ears are almost standing up there? Make a little, another one. Okay, and sometimes, like if she, they've been sleeping in the straw, but like early in the morning, both of her ears like stand straight up. Okay, uh, so we know she's not going to be as big later on. And it's kind of the same thing with their paws, you know. But uh, I'm telling you, pretty reliable indicator how big they're going to be uh, if they have a nice typey head is how quickly their ears stand up. Okay, but so I brought this puppy in because uh, she's the smallest one in the litter. And a lot of times people ask me things like, um, hey, Stoney, what about the pick of the litter versus the runt of the litter, okay? And, you know, I try to explain to people that it's not so black and white like that. All right, so this little dog, she's small. 
Uh, but she has extremely good balance. She's a good eater. She's uh, uh, easy to motivate. And when we go outside, like when we take them out back, uh, she's always not, she's not too close. She's not needy, but she's not too far. And as soon as you whistle for her or click for her, then, uh, you know, she just, uh, she comes right along. So she's actually one of my favorites. Now, is she as big and strong and tough as the roller derby queen? No, not right now. You know what I'm saying? But, uh, there's a, there's a lot of things that can happen over the course of the first year. And so when you're looking at a litter, you have to like think in terms of like what you're trying to get out of the litter. So I was just after some good typey farm family guard dogs, okay? And all of these dogs are going to be able to do that job very well. And the fact that, uh, you know, one of them might end up a little bigger than the others, it's not going to really make any difference. These dogs ain't uh, not jumping out of helicopters and hunting down terrorists. You know, they're not going into, to, uh, you know, uh, barns and, 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 and dragging out the moonshiners or whatever they do with mean dogs nowadays, okay? These dogs are going, you know, ca canoeing and kayaking and four-wheeler riding and camping and doing fun stuff, you know. And so as long as the dog is big enough and brave enough to stand up for itself and stand up for my family, then I'm going to be pretty happy. The main thing that I want to make sure is they've got this nice square build and they've got uh, good musculature, they've got a good coat, they're sweet, oh my gosh, but they can stand up for themselves. And even though this little, this little dog is small, right, she's got a lot of character. And so the roller derby queen sometimes will come over and try to take Black Sister stuff. And Black Sister fights her every time. Now, here's where you tell, know a good dog, okay? She loses every time. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't matter because her mind is strong. You see what I'm saying? And every time she fights back, the roller derby queen like gives up a little easier. So it used to be when they first started like uh, separating in terms of physical ability, it used to be that the roller derby queen would just like uh, like really run over Black Sister. But Black Sister stood up for herself and she took a whipping one time and then another and then another and then another and finally the roller derby queen said, oh, that's enough, I give up. <laughs> like I'll just quit bothering. And then if you don't watch it sometimes, what'll happen is this one will get real feisty and she'll be like, uh, you know, she'll be like up on the steps and she'll just jump off and pounce on the roller derby queen when the roller derby queen's not expecting it. Okay, so like that's what you have to think about guys. There's not, it's just like life is not as simple as just there's a, you know, there's a, there's there's a pick of the litter, there's a runt of the litter. Now there is a, you know, like if you're doing a very specific job with dogs, there's a very specific hierarchy of the litter. And out of that specific hierarchy, even when you're talking about picks, what you're really talking about is just the top percentage of the litter. And no, like if you have a litter of, let's say I had a litter of eight, you know, um, positions one, two, and three, um, you know, they're not static. So three might become one, two might become one, and they change, and then they hit puberty and it changes again. You know, just like athletes. You know, ain't you ever seen like a really good basketball player in middle school? He just got tall real fast. He hit puberty early, got tall real fast, then he wasn't that good in high school. And then sometimes your marginal athletes in middle school and high school become good college athletes, and sometimes your marginal college athletes become good players. Now, of course, the very special ones, they stand out, you know, from the beginning, okay? So what you'll notice is that with a litter of puppies like this, litter of eight, we had, uh, you know, three, and this one wasn't in the top three, but we have three whose positions jockey and change a little bit. Uh, and uh, they're not going to change, you know, with six, seven, and eight, okay? But six, seven, and eight is going to change. Then you got kind of a couple of middle puppies. And those middle puppies, uh, you just don't know. You're just not for sure. You know, are they going to turn out to be a little bit on the laid back side for what you want to do? Uh, or are they going to kind of go the other direction and become a little bit too excitable, a little too aggressive for what you want to do? So there's just a lot of waiting and seeing, you know, uh, as it relates to puppies and puppy development and genetics. But what we know for sure is that if we do our part, we're going to maximize the puppy's potential. Okay, and that's what we're going to talk about next is about potential. Right, Black Sister, you got a lot of potential, don't you? You're a very good dog. Okay, now let's talk about potential for a second because it always comes up. Uh, pick of the litter versus the runt or the best puppy in the litter versus the not best puppy in the litter, right? I mean, but here's the reality, guys. I have seen in <laughs> many a time more than one pick of the litter be sold out of a litter, right? You got to remember being happy with a dog is a subjective process. It's not really an objective process, right? So, uh, like take this dog, for example. This is a beautiful dog. Now, does this dog have quite as 
as much drive as his two brothers? Not right now, you know, like uh, like when you get the tug out, uh, uh, when you go adventuring, this guy, he's kind of staying close, he's pretty lazy. But one of the things you don't think about, I mean, this guy's huge, right? So, I mean, he weighs right at 18 pounds. And uh, so all of his energy is going towards growth. That's a lot of bone, it's a lot of muscle, it's a lot of connective tissue, and that's a lot of brain to build in a short period of time. Okay, so like if you do a puppy test, a lot of times, you know, like uh, puppies that are growing real fast, they just don't have a lot of energy to do your silly test. <laughs> uh, another thing that happens with uh, like pick of the litter versus not pick of the litter dogs is the kind of people that go looking for pick of the litter are off, off, oftentimes very motivated owners. Okay, and so like they pick a dog and maybe it's one of three picks of the litter <laughs> because everybody likes to sell extra picks of the litter. Uh, but uh, then you give sell that to a motivated uh, owner and you're going to get. Uh, you know, good expression later. And what I mean by expression is that you have to understand this. Ultimately, the puppy, as it matures into an adult dog, is an expression of the combination of its raw genetic potential plus environmental circumstances plus experiences, okay? So you have to start off with good genetics, then you get new, good nutrition, and then you get uh, like a lot of experiences, and that's how you, you know, maximize the potential of a puppy. But trust me, guys, life is about realized potential. Life is not about potential. There's a lot of people in the world, and there's a lot of dogs in the world that have this much raw potential, okay? but they don't utilize it. So if they have 100 units of raw potential and they only utilize 70, you might have a dog that only has 80 units of raw potential, but they utilize every unit, okay? So don't get too awful caught up on that uh, pick of the litter stuff, okay? Because ultimately, you have a lot of control over the ultimate expression of what your dog becomes. So that's a really important thing to do. All right, so I went and got uh, these two puppies. Now these two girls, uh, they're the sweetest and kind of least drivey puppies out of the litter. And so like whenever I've got little kids over and stuff and they're like, hey Stoney, can I play with the puppies? I'm like, yeah. And I say, go pick up these two light colored ones. Because these little two girls here, we call this one White Spot and this one Angel. Is that what we call that, this one? Yeah. Angel. <laughs> I know you guys are killing me on my names. I used to have good names for dogs. Go back and watch my old videos. I just ran out of good names. Okay, but let's talk about potential, okay? These two puppies have the potential to be awesome dogs, awesome family dogs, awesome adventure dogs, awesome farm dogs, okay? I mean, they're just great in every way except that when you break out a tug, they don't want to tug as much, you know what I'm saying? When you pick them up, they want to lick on your ear and they want to snuggle. They don't attack your face as much, you know? Now, as I say that, this one's trying to tear up <laughs> my bed. Okay, so you have to understand, guys, whenever you're talking about, like, uh, puppies and their potential to do certain things, you judging on a scale. <laughs> Now, so the most laid back puppies in this litter are still pretty oral, they're still pretty aggressive. Like I said, they're going to make great farm dogs, great guard dogs, great adventure dogs, okay? And you're going to be able to trust them to at least stand up to an intruder. Now, are these two going to be man fighters in the future? No, probably not. They're going to be man lovers. But that's for the men that they're used to and the men that they've had a lot of exposure to. For, you know, if a man, a criminal that comes in, they're going to, they're going to do their best to stand up. Now, does that mean that uh, you can fully, like, uh, put your home defensive strategy on one of these two sweeties? No, of course not. But they can bark enough for you to call the police. They can bark enough for you to get your family in the safe room. They can bark or nip enough for you to get your uh, shotgun out, right? So that's what we're after, guys. We're after having puppies that, out of a whole litter of puppies, we accept the fact that there's not going to be an exceptional litter. People try this all the time. They'll take an exceptional dog and breed it to an exceptional bitch and pretend that they're going to have a whole litter of exceptional puppies, okay? But you have to understand that being exceptional is the outlier, okay? So you just can't do it that way. You can't, you, you, you can't breed super dogs. And remember when we first started this series, we were talking about like the super dog program. Well, okay, that program didn't pan out because not every dog can be a super dog on an objective scale. But remember what I said earlier, being happy with a dog or having the pick of the litter is a subjective evaluation, okay? So you could take these two dogs, who to me, 
you know, they don't have a ton of drive. They're not very, you know, they're not very tough. They're not super oral. And you're up here watching them tear these beds up. And you're like, Miss Tony, they're biting and carrying on all the time. And I saw them bite on your coveralls the other day and hold on on Instagram. Okay, yeah, but they give up after a while. And you might say, well, Stoney, a dog that'll bite you in, you know, at seven weeks and hold on to your pants for two minutes is pretty tough. It's a subjective scale, guys. Everything, is, everything in life is, is based on subjective metrics. And so what I want you to, to leave you with in terms of the uh, conversation on potential is you just have to make sure that your puppy has enough potential to be the dog that you want it to be. It has to be able to perform under the circumstances that you see you and your family living under, okay? And never forget that the total expression of a puppy is genetics, you know, it's raw genetic base, plus environmental factors, plus experiences. That's what ultimately gives you the dog uh, that you have when it's an adult. So if you go to getting a puppy and uh, you know the pick of the litter is not available, the second pick of the litter is not available, the third pick of the litter is not available, right? Because guy needed a new transmission in his truck. Right? All those picks of the litters are gone. That does not mean that the puppy that's left is not good enough to be awesome for your family. Okay, I would take either of these two puppies. Now, objectively, if somebody asks me, they say, hey, Stoney, you know, these two dogs here, you know, I do a dog sport, I jump off of the, into the pool, I, whatever dog sports they're doing now. Objectively, I would say, well, these guys, you know, they're probably not your dogs, right? But even those sports like that, ultimately, it's just about going out and having a good time with your dog. So if you have this little sweetie, and you love spending time with her and you love snuggling her, okay? And she's not the best dock diver, she's not the best bite work dog, but you love spending time with her, you love doing the activities with her, okay? That's what matters, okay? Life is about realized potential and that applies to the dog, that applies to yourself, and that most importantly applies to your relationship with your dog, okay? I've seen a lot of people buy a lot of really nice dogs and they're never happy with them because they always expect just a little bit more, okay? So, uh, you know, the last thing I'm gonna say on uh, potential, guys, is find a dog that you love, okay? And then make sure that the potential amount of love between you and that puppy is maximized because that ultimately is what determines whether or not you're happy with your dog in the long run. <laughs> All right, so the last thing we're going to talk about is breeder and owner optimization strategies. Now, I'm the breeder and owner of this particular puppy because it's the one I'm keeping, and uh, I can tell you what I'm going to do with him, okay, to optimize his potential. So I'm going to get out and I'm going to do more for the next few weeks, okay? I'm going to do more socialization with dogs. I'm going to do more socialization with other animals. I'm going to do more socialization with people. And, uh, you know, we're going to do a whole lot more environmental socialization where we put them in a wide range of environmental so uh, can you know, situations uh, under a wide variety of environmental factors. So hot, cold, wet, muddy, you know, all the stuff we can think of. We're going to put them in those situations and we're going to let them learn, okay? Because right now, guys, this is when these puppies are learning, okay? And for all the stuff that dog trainers talk about, you know, what's really important to understand with uh, ensuring proper puppy development is the adaptive stress response. And so all the rest of the videos that you see, you know, we've kind of had these puppies in here and uh, uh, we've been showing you in our office, but all the rest of the puppies, all the rest of the videos you're going to see, we're going to be outside doing stuff, okay? And that's what I want you to do. I want you to get outside and I want you to do some stuff, okay? And what happens when you do stuff, when you put stress on a dog, the dog's body and mind adapts to that stress. That's why it's called the adaptive stress response. If you want to ensure proper growth, proper bone growth, proper musculature development, proper connective tissue development, and a good, solid, clear mind, okay? Then you have to get these guys out and you have to start stressing them early, okay? And people say, well, Stoney, what do you mean stressing them? I don't wanna, I don't wanna be stressing my dog. Yes, you do. You do wanna stress them a little bit, okay? Life is about, you know, co conquering physically and mentally challenging activities. And as a society, we've just gotten too far away from that. We've gotten too far away from it for ourselves, for our children, for our dogs. And that's why everybody has trouble 
trouble with everything. You know, people, they take pharmaceutical drugs. They are scared to go outside without wearing a mask. They're scared of getting sick. It's just we live in a can't-do society. And being in a can't-do society, it's a kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. I have a little puppy. I don't exercise it. And then when it gets older, I try to take it out. It doesn't have any social skills. doesn't have good proper uh, proprioception. doesn't have good bone, musculature development, and connective tissue development. So it gets injured. And then the vet asks me, say, hey, Stoney, how'd your dog get injured? I'm like, well, I took it to the dog park and it was playing. Oh, well, it must be the playing that injured the dog. No, it, it's not the playing. It's not the doing physically demanding activities. It's the fact that the dog was not properly prepared to live an active life, okay? So during this period, if you're a breeder and you're doing one of those, uh, you know, like uh, keep them a little longer to socialize them and train them, don't worry too much about sit and down and stand and, you know, whatever. Put your clickers away. Get your puppies out and do some stuff with them. Hey, guys, and if you just got a new puppy, you know, get that puppy out and do stuff with it. Now, does that mean that you got to go out and you got to be like uh, haphazard with its health? No, but you know, you know your area, right? You know, if you don't know your area, ask around. Do you live in a pathogen-rich environment or not, you know? Do you have friends that have vaccinated dogs that aren't, um, you know, that aren't carriers of disease? I mean, of course you do, right? And if you don't, go to church and you'll meet some people who have nice dogs. <laughs> and then you'll have some friends and your dog will have some friends and y'all go out and go on a hike and everybody will be better off. So this is me and my dog signing off. This is the end of our uh, indoor puppy developmental stages uh, videos and everything else from now on out will be us out doing stuff that uh, we call uh, puppy-sized adventures and, and, and emphasizing the concept of learning by doing. Okay, that's the big thing in dog training, guys. I don't care about your methodology. I don't care if you're a traditional trainer or, or, or a positive reinforcement trainer or whatever you want to call yourself. I just want you to get out, be interesting, do, do fun stuff, guys. Get out and have fun with your dogs because when you're having fun with your dogs, your dog's having fun. And uh, when your dog's having fun, you'll love it more. And when you love it more, then uh, like you'll go out and do more stuff with it. It's, it's an awesome cycle. All right, so I'll see you guys next week, and we'll be doing something awesome.